In this video, we shall continue to introduce ourselves to the antiplatelet, anticoagulant and fibrinolytic or thrombolytic drugs. In the previous videos, we discussed that there are various mechanisms by which blood is maintained in the fluid state in the absence of endothelial injury. Now, these mechanisms include the protein C pathway, antithrombin 3, otherwise called antithrombin, and other pathways. Let us now focus our attention more on antithrombin. Now we discussed that coagulation occurs with the help of coagulation factors which are synthesized from the liver. Antithrombin is a protein which is also synthesized by the liver. Here is a cut section of a blood vessel with the endothelial cells intact. There is the liver and there it produces antithrombin. Now antithrombin is going to inhibit factor 2A and factor 10A. It also potentiates prostacyclin or PGI2, which is responsible for vasodilatation as well as inhibition of platelet activity. Now, the anticoagulant activity of antithrombin 3 is very weak when it acts alone. However, the anticoagulant activity of antithrombin 3 can be greatly potentiated by a substance which by itself has no intrinsic anticoagulant activity whatsoever. The name of the substance is heparin or heparin, however you want to pronounce it. Heparin is found physiologically in mast cells. It is a very powerful organic acid. In fact, it is the most powerful organic acid in the human body. The physiological quantities of heparin found in the mast cells are insufficient to activate antithrombin. So, we know that antithrombin inhibits factor 2A and 10A, but that this effect is very weak. We know that heparin by itself has no anticoagulant activity, and we know that physiological quantities of heparin are insufficient to potentiate the effect of antithrombin. However, when we combine pharmacological doses of heparin with antithrombin, then the effect of endogenous antithrombin is greatly potentiated. So it's important for us to remember that pharmacological doses of heparin will do nothing in the absence of antithrombin. And since antithrombin is absolutely required for the anticoagulant activity, of heparin to take effect, heparin is classified as an indirect inhibitor of thrombin. It is a parenteral anticoagulant. So when we classify anticoagulants into oral anticoagulants, parenteral thrombin inhibitors and others, we can classify the parenteral thrombin inhibitors into indirect inhibitors of thrombin and direct inhibitors of thrombin. The indirect inhibitors of thrombin include heparin and its derivatives, which would include unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and fond parinux. The examples of low molecular weight heparin include tinzaparin, enoxaparin, and daltaparin. Now, although heparin is classified as an indirect inhibitor of thrombin, if we take a look at these three molecules, they differ in their ability to inhibit thrombin. And this is important for us to understand. Now, if we consider unfractionated heparin, UFH will inhibit thrombin very powerfully. On the other hand, low molecular weight heparin inhibits thrombin poorly. And Fonda Paradox does not inhibit thrombin at all. On the other hand, all three of these molecules inhibit factor 10A equally. Now, if we consider the effect of unfractionated heparin on 2A and 10A, the inhibition is equal. On the other hand, unfractionated heparin inhibits factor 10A three times more powerfully than it would inhibit factor 2A. Now, let us move on to the role of vitamin K in coagulation. 
we discussed earlier that coagulation factors are synthesized by the liver and some of these coagulation factors require vitamin K for their activation. These factors include factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. The form of vitamin K that is required for the activation of these factors is the reduced form of vitamin K, also called the hydroquinone form of vitamin K. So there's the reduced form of vitamin K, otherwise called the hydroquinone form of vitamin K. There are the factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. Now the activation of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 requires an enzyme called gamma glutamyl carboxylase. This enzyme will carboxylate the glutamyl residues present at the gamma positions of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. And for this enzyme to work, the hydroquinone form of vitamin K is required. So let's see how this works. So factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 will combine with vitamin K, the reduced form of vitamin K in the presence of gamma glutamyl carboxylase to give two products, the activated form of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 as well as the reduced form of vitamin K, otherwise called the epoxide form of vitamin K. Let's see how that happens. So there you go, the activated form of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 as well as the oxidized form of vitamin K, otherwise called the epoxide form of vitamin K. Now this form of vitamin K is useless and it needs to be reconverted to the hydroquinone form. This process requires an enzyme and it is called vitamin K epoxide reductase or VCOR C1. VCOR C1 converts the oxidized form of vitamin K back to the reduced form and makes it available for the activation of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 again. Now we have a drug that inhibits the enzyme VCOR C1 and the name of that drug is warfarin. So warfarin inhibits the enzyme VCOR C1 or vitamin K epoxide reductase and in doing so there is failure to regenerate the hydroquinone form of vitamin K and when this happens there is a failure of gamma glutamyl carboxylase enzyme and there is a failure of gamma carboxylation of the glutamyl residues on factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. In other words, these factors fail to get activated. Right, so anticoagulants prevent blood from clotting unnecessarily, but what about those clots that have already been formed? Can we lyse them? Or in other words, is thrombolysis or fibrinolysis possible? Well, the answer is yes. However, thrombolysis works best only for very recently formed thrombi. Older thrombi have extensive fibrin polymerization and this makes them more resistant to thrombolysis. Right, so this is a diagram that we discussed in the previous video. We said that the liver produces plasminogen and plasminogen is converted to plasmin with the help of tissue plasminogen activator that is released by the intact endothelium. The plasmin then proceeds to lyse the clot. Fibrinolytic agents or thrombolytic agents are also called plasminogen activators. They may be divided into two, the fibrin specific agents and the non-fibrin specific agents. The fibrin specific agents include retiplase, altiplase and tenecteplase, while the non-fibrin specific agents include streptokinase and urokinase. The fibrin specific agents convert plasminogen to plasmin only in the presence of fibrin clots, while the non-fibrin specific agents convert plasminogen to plasmin irrespective of the presence of fibrin clots and therefore these drugs are more likely to cause uncontrolled bleeding. 
So if at all uncontrolled bleeding occurs, can we reverse this bleeding? So in such situations, thrombolytic or fibrinolytic reversal may be required. This may be achieved by the administration of cryoprecipitate or antifibrinolytic or antithrombolytic agents. So, we discussed that plasminogen needs to be bound to the fibrin clot for tissue plasminogen activator to convert plasminogen to plasmin. If we administer drugs that inhibit plasminogen from binding to the fibrin clot, then tissue plasminogen activator will find it very difficult to convert plasminogen to plasmin. The drugs that perform this sort of function are called antifibrinolytic or antithrombolytic drugs and they include epsilon aminocapraic acid and tranexamic acid. Although these drugs are used for the reversal of thrombolysis or fibrinolysis, evidence supporting their use for this particular indication is limited. Antifibrinolytic agents or antithrombolytic agents are more commonly used in situations where lysis of clots is not desirable. This includes situations like heavy menstrual bleeding, following tooth extraction in hemophilia patients and in massive hemorrhage. We will continue this discussion in the next video.